May I have you loud and clear? <laughs> Hello. 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 Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Science. And that is to say, physics, medicine, nature, or space, time, the brain, life, the universe. This week, grab your trainers. In recognition of the Cambridge Half Marathon, we're looking at the science of running. And ahead of that, in the news, a new way to attack tuberculosis. The UK announces major funding for artificial intelligence and why it's a myth that a stiff drink warms you up on a winter's day. Hello, I'm Chris Smith, and this is The Naked Scientist. The Naked Scientist podcast is powered by UKfast.co.uk. A suicide switch that triggers the bacteria that cause TB, tuberculosis, to kill themselves has been uncovered by scientists in France. The discovery could enable scientists to develop a new class of antibiotic drugs that can trip this switch and cause the bacteria to die. This would also be a very big help in combating the problem of antibiotic resistance. Respiratory specialist Andreas Floto from the University of Cambridge, who wasn't involved in the study himself, took me through the findings. This group's been interested in understanding how to kill Mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is what causes TB. And what they've focused on is a toxin, antitoxin system. This is a strategy that's used by lots of bacteria where they produce a poison and at the same time produce an antidote. And what that means is that other bacteria that don't have the antidote will die. So what this group have found is that one of the toxin-antitoxin systems can be manipulated, meaning if you block the antitoxin, then the bacteria die. And they've proposed that this is an exciting new way to kill tuberculosis. So what we would make some kind of drug molecule that would either activate the toxin or deactivate the antitoxin so we push the bugs into basically committing suicide. Absolutely. So the idea is by solving the structure of both the toxin and the antitoxin, understanding how they bind and neutralise each other normally, you can imagine that a structure-guided development of a small molecule could block that interaction, allow the toxin to remain active and allow, as you say, the bacteria to commit suicide. So this is, when you say structure, the three-dimensional structure, where the atoms are in three-dimensional space, essentially. You're exactly right. It's a three-dimensional structure, and it's done by looking at crystals with X-rays. But once you've got that structure, you can see exactly where each atom is and, and how to block interactions. And how did they uncover this in the first place? They sequentially knocked out all of the genes in TB and asked the question which genes were essential. And it turns out that they'd knocked out one of the antitoxin pairs. And by knocking out the antitoxin, it allowed the toxin to remain unneutralized and hence the bacteria killed. So once they realized that this toxin-antitoxin system was so potent, if you neutralized the antitoxin, they proved that if you induce the expression of the toxin on its own without the antitoxin, you killed the bacteria. And they did that in liquid culture and perhaps most impressively in mice. And that means that the the strategy is sound to try to then activate such a system as a means of persuading these microbes to kill themselves. Right. It's a proof of concept experiment. I think the hard work now is to develop antibiotic-like molecules that can do this in real life. Do they know how the toxin persuades the microbe to kill itself because that's another interesting part of the story isn't it because if you can not just understand the toxin but also understand what lies downstream of it you could plug into that downstream system to kill it too yeah so tb like all organisms relies on metabolism that's the breakdown of uh, nutrients in order to make energy and one of the key components of that is this molecule called nad and what they found was that this toxin splits NAD and inactivates it and effectively starves the bacteria into death. So you're right, this is a really exciting mechanism of action for the toxin and again may open up new avenues for new drugs. Do we have anything that looks like it could be a candidate to do that? Because that molecule you mentioned, NAD, is it's ubiquitous in life, isn't it? Many, many systems use that. So by going after it, could we end up with a drug with lots and lots of side effects? 
Yeah, so I th- I think uh, that's absolutely right. I mean, the beauty of the toxin is it seems to be specific for bacteria. So they did quite a lot of studies looking at human cells and didn't really find an increase in toxicity in the human cells. Now, that's very different from proving that it's safe, um, but it does kind of suggest that this may be a very neat, specific way of killing tuberculosis. And will it be specific just for mycobacterium tuberculosis, what we call human TB? Because Obviously, if you wind the clock back, there were lots of humans who caught TB from cows, Mycobacterium bovis, it's relative. Can it target more than just TB? Yeah, no. So in theory, this should be applicable across all mycobacterial species. There's about 160 species that infect other animals or in the environment and occasionally infect vulnerable people. And it may also have effects on other bacteria, so more distant species of bacteria. So it's potentially very interesting. Because TB not to put a finer point on it, is a massive international scourge and getting worse, isn't it? It's a huge problem. I mean, the estimates are that about a third of the population have been exposed to TB at some point. There's something like 10 million or so cases a year of TB, about 2 million deaths. So it's a big problem. There's been huge efforts and a lot of success actually in controlling TB. The big problem now is multidrug resistant TB, which is running at about half a million cases a year and is a real headache. Nevertheless, hopefully one that we can overcome. That was Andreas Floto, who was commenting on the work by Olivier Nerol and his colleagues, and it was published in the journal Molecular Cell. We're out into space now, and the mystery of how our solar system formed and from what has puzzled scientists for centuries. But now a Japanese mission is hoping to take us a step closer to an answer. Izzy Clark. In 2014, the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, aka JAXA, launched Hayabusa 2, a spacecraft the size of a fridge, to explore a nearby asteroid that, they hope, can tell us about the materials that formed our solar system over four and a half billion years ago. Hayabusa 2 finally caught up with the asteroid Ryugu in June last year, travelling in convoy until it was ready to take a closer look. And now, on Friday the 22nd of February, the spacecraft began the task of collecting a sample of this rock to bring back to Earth. David Rothery from the Open University explained why this asteroid was so special. Carbonaceous chondrites, which are the type represented by this asteroid, are meteorites, which when we find them on the Earth, they weather away quite quickly because it's quite weak, friable material, so it's very rare to find really fresh examples. From what we have got, we can tell it's very primitive material. It's not been heated or melted. So it's the building blocks from which all the planets have been made. So going to a fresh piece of carbonaceous chondrite material that hasn't been subjected to the Earth's atmosphere is going to give us untainted material from the birth of the solar system that hasn't been processed. So it's a great target for sampling. Now, what's actually on board this Hayabusa 2? It's quite a complicated little spacecraft. There are cameras on board. We can do a little bit of mineralogy from close range. But the spacecraft has got four rovers on board, three of which have been deployed so far. And they've been down to the surface and they've hopped around a little. I haven't got any wheels. There's not enough gravity to get any traction on the surface. So they're hopping around on the surface. The chief aim of the mission is to bring back some samples and that's what's just been attempted for the first time. The rovers helped identify places that weren't too bouldering, had enough fine dust because the sampling technique is to bring the main spacecraft within touching distance of the surface so a kind of horn device covers part of the surface and then they fire a pellet into the surface which kicks up some dust if you like and some dust gets captured in the sample capsule, which then is sealed and is brought back to Earth. Essentially, Ryugu is like a giant floating pile of rubble. Because Hayabusa 2 isn't able to land on its surface, it sort of floats above the asteroid, waiting to scoop up any displaced rubble and dust as the pellet is shot into its surface. And if you think that sounds tricky, you'd be absolutely right. The difficulty is that the dust you kick up is quite fine and not a lot of it. And you've got to hope enough of it gets inside your little capsule to be a worthwhile sample. 
That's a gamble, but any sample brought back to Earth is going to give valuable information because it will be completely fresh, pristine material, at least fresh from space. None of these are the kind of material that you'll get from a meteorite that's fallen to Earth because that's been subject to the Earth's atmosphere on the way in and however long it's been sat on the ground before being collected. The gravity on this object is not very strong, so how challenging is that to coordinate a mission? Well, yes, it's it's a one kilometre sized body, so the surface gravity there is negligible. If you land on it, you're likely to bounce. The, the tiny rovers that have been deployed, they've done tiny little hops around, but they're very leisurely hops. So it's a very difficult object to actually get a hold of. And sampling it is a problem. If you, if you go to the surface and try and grab something, all you're going to do is push yourself away. Hence the sampling strategy to fire a pellet into it and catch some of the dust kicked off. Yeah, low gravity gives you quite a difficult environment to work in. But all things going well, in December 2020, that sample will make its way back to us on Earth. This mission isn't just about finding out how our solar system came to be. It's pushing the forefront of technology and trying to see how humans can take a sample from an object that's 180 million miles away and then bring it back. But how can some rock and dust reveal so much? Well, what you can do with samples on the ground is subject them to very precise geochemical analysis. And in particular, you can fingerprint where the sample came from. And different parts of the solar system are characterised by different signatures. And this is important, for example, to tell us where the Earth's water came from. It used to be supposed, for example, that a lot of the Earth's water was supplied by comets. But you may remember the mission to Comet 67P, the Rosetta mission, that measured the signature of the water in that comet. And that doesn't match the signature of the water in the Earth's oceans. So assuming that comet is representative, which is quite a big if, it suggests that maybe the Earth's oceans weren't supplied by water delivered by comets. Well, maybe the Earth's ocean water was sweated out from um, hydrous minerals delivered by carbonaceous chondrites hitting the Earth. We'll get an idea of that when we've fingerprinted the material from Ryugu that's been brought back by Hayabusa 2. And of course, it did go well with the sample collection, meaning that the returning specimen should hopefully come whizzing into the Earth's atmosphere initially at a heady 12 kilometres a second before slowing itself down with a parachute and landing somewhere in Australia's Woomera test range in 2020. Fingers crossed got a biological brain buster or a chemical query? Ask the Naked Scientists. I just wanted to know about sleep paralysis. Is it a disorder or condition and can it be cured? How much energy is in moonlight? And could solar panel technology be used to capture this energy? When you cook food with any alcohol, how much, if any, percentage of the alcohol stays behind? Every Friday, The Naked Scientist and Cape Talk unravel the science behind those weird and wonderful questions you've always wanted to ask. Download and listen for free at thenakedscientist.com slash ask or simply search and subscribe to Ask The Naked Scientist on your favourite podcast app. Still to come on The Naked Scientist, researchers publish the genetic roadmap for how an early embryo develops and later on we sprint through the science of running. But first, this week, the UK's leading science funding body, that's the UK Research and Innovation Group, announced a significant investment in artificial intelligence, or AI-based research. The purpose of the £200 million initiative, which will be invested across the country, is to help the UK to maintain its status as a world leader in this sector. Cambridge is one of the centres awarded funding, where researchers are going to harness AI to enable them to sift through massive data sets looking for patterns that the human brain could never spot in things like climate data and earthquake measurements. Scott Hosking is a member of the initiative. He's at the British Antarctic Survey and he uses machine learning tools like this to understand climate change. So, Scott, presumably you welcome this announcement. This is super exciting. This is an absolute game changer uh, for Cambridge and also the UK climate community. So our data sets are getting larger, larger year on year. And it's fantastic there. We've got some extra help 
and these algorithms to help us sift through that data. What are you going to spend it on? Because you're going to get about six million pounds worth of funding over initially five years with this, aren't you? So That's... how will you be managing the project? What are you going to spend the money on? So this is a centre for doctoral training. So this is a, a five year project which brings in 50 students over the five years, but hopefully we'll bring in more than that because we have all this industrial funding. So we have Google on board and Microsoft and uh, there's over 30 partners in total. So this is big. Okay, you, so you're going to be effectively investing in the next generation. If you're going for PhD students, these are early career researchers. Absolutely. We need these new algorithms, we need these new tools, and we need to build that expertise first. So we are building the next generation of climate scientists that also have this machine learning, artificial intelligence uh, know-how, which is something my generation didn't have. Yeah, so it's literally investing in the project. It's investing in technology and that sort of research and development, but also a strong investment in people. A huge so, yeah. investment in people, exactly. And we'll benefit from that as the general public Indeed. to improve our future climate predictions. We need these large data sets in order to look at extreme events, for instance. There's no point looking at a one in a thousand year event if we only have a thousand years worth of future climate data. So we really need to be running tens, hundreds of thousands of years into the future and to do that we need fast climate models so one thing we're looking at is including ai machine learning algorithms in the models themselves to speed them up and also once we have all that data how are we going to analyze it us as uh, scientists we really struggle to use traditional tools just to zoom in if, if we're interested for instance in heat waves in london we may just zoom in over europe but actually, we, we should really be looking at all the data we have and look for those patterns in the data. Maybe there's something in Brazil or a feature or something we've seen in the Arctic, is, which is very relevant to our climate. So we can feed all that in. So explaining to people just for a second how this actually works. So when we're making predictions about what the climate is going to do in the future, is it fair to say you're essentially getting together enormous numbers of measurements you're then asking a human at the moment to try to spot patterns in all of that whereas if you ask a computer to relentlessly go through and explore the relationships between all these numbers and all these enormous complexities it will spot the needle in the haystack that we can't that's right so the data not only is vast but it's also various so we have all sorts of information. We have satellite data, we have climate model data, all with their different variables, different weather variables, so temperature, humidity, pressure, etc. And just trying to picture all that in anyone's head is just unfathomable. So we need those computer models which can build these really complex, large, multi-dimensional systems and search for those relationships, cross-validate things we may not even think is relevant. But actually, if it does come out relevant, that could be a game changer. Now, how does the AI or the machine learning side of it come into the equation? So machine learning sort of under the hood is just the statistical algorithms that we've been using for decades. Learning is key here. All we're doing with these algorithms is looking for those relationships and providing uh, an answer or possible answer to a person. We're not doing AI at the moment because the I, the intelligence, suggests that we're going to do something with that data. For self-driving cars the car needs to be intelligent to know whether to slam the brakes on. Our intelligence comes from businesses or the government officials that need to make those decisions. So the machine learning is that layer to provide decision makers with a robust set of tools in which they can make their decisions. Researchers from many different fields are using these sorts of approaches now, though, aren't they? Uh, for instance, in, in the last two years, we've seen researchers take pictures of skin lesions and then ask a computer to learn what a healthy mole versus a potentially cancerous mole looks like. And by the time it's finished learning, it can outperform dermatologists who have been through umpteen years of medical school and you know board-level exams to make sure they're, they're good doctors. So could this system effectively teach itself what to look for, though? Absolutely. So we could look at satellite images, for instance. We could look at how disease spreads in uh, forests and vegetation, or how different uh, crops, how their crop yields are suffering. So these are things which the naked eye, our human eye, might struggle to pick out those signals. But a machine learning algorithm, given enough data, can see those signals. And what does it then do with that information? Does it sort of flag to you and say, OK, I've spotted this relationship. Here's one that you need to now work on yeah so we should never use machine learning as a black box and just trust the answer you do need to still maintain your expertise in climate science look at that information and say well, actually does this make sense and maybe 
you'll go back to take a more traditional approach and build up a, a computer model to follow through a new theory. I also mentioned uh, earthquake data and things like that because I know that you're looking specifically at what the climate has been doing, will be doing, but you could take the same knowledge and the same approach drawing huge amounts of information together to find out how this things and systems work and apply it to many different things. We can apply these algorithms all over the world. So for we can look at uh, ice sheets and melting ice sheets and what that means for the communities and the Himalayas. There are 2 billion people that uh, rely on these water. So these algorithms are an absolute game changer for people. Scott, thank you. We must leave it there. Scott Hosking from the British Antarctic Survey in Cambridge. Now... At conception, a single sperm and a single egg meet and they unite their DNA. And this triggers a developmental program controlled by our genes that causes the fertilised egg and the cells it turns into to begin to divide and to grow. And next, that ball of cells that this produces begin to specialise and certain groups of those cells ultimately turn into different bits of the adult body. Sometimes, though, this goes wrong. But because we don't know what genetic programmes are running in which cells... We don't know why, and therefore we don't know how to fix it. On the flip side, if scientists want to grow replacement body parts in a dish, for instance, at the moment, we don't know precisely what instructions to feed to the cells to make that happen. But now scientists at Cambridge University have done the painstaking job of reading the genetic instructions that are active in every one of the 100,000 cells that form right at the beginning of the development of a mouse embryo, and including, at that crucial time, when those cells are deciding what they're going to turn into. Bertie Gotkins. What happens is that the embryo grows from a really small number of cells. It's less than 1,000 cells. In 48 hours, it grows to over 100,000 cells. And there is this explosion of diversity. When we begin, the cells are unspecified. They can turn into any cell in your body, whether it's muscle, heart, blood, brain, etc. And then within a period of just 48 hours, they make decisions of what they want to become. Huge, huge challenge, though. Embryologists have been grappling with that very issue for about 100 years. So how did you attack it? Really, the opportunity arose through new technology called single-cell genomics. And what that means is, from a single cell, we can make really comprehensive measurements of what goes on in this single cell. Before, we had to use millions of cells to do the same types of measurements. Now we can do it on single cells. And this technology has really only become available in the last five years. Talk me through then what it is you're measuring and how you're measuring it. Each of our cells has about 20,000 genes. These are the bits of our DNA that determine the function of the cells. And what we are measuring is the activity of all of these genes. And the amazing thing is that we can measure the activity of 20,000 genes in each individual cell. And the data set that we generated has done exactly this in over 100,000 single cells. Essentially, it boils down to then you are looking at very early stages of development, looking at the cells and saying what repertoire of genes are switched on and by how much in these cells and how does that change as these cells grow, proliferate and also critically start to turn into things, make decisions about what bits of the future body plan they're Mm. going to be. Yes, and this is important for two reasons. What activity profile characterizes a cell directly tells us something about the function of the cell and how this function arises from an unspecified precursor. The second point is it also tells us if we are looking at a situation where there might be a developmental disorder, what's wrong with these cells now compared to normally? Now that we have these very detailed molecular profiles, we can ask those questions that before were completely inaccessible to us. The other issue is We want to know how does this particular cell or population of cells know, in inverted commas, to, say, become an arm or become an intestine or become a future liver? And what messages are they passing among themselves to fix them to that fate, Mm -hmm. but also tell them not to become something else? So does your system now give us a clue as to what some of those messages and signals and control pathways might be? In essence, not yet, because what our study has provided is a baseline, a reference to in future ask exactly those questions. Because I think in order to get a solid answer to those questions, we do actually have to look at mutations where, let's say, an arm can't be formed and then say, what is now different specifically in terms of gene activities? So it is 
an essential and very vital reference point for us to then move on. Now, mice are very similar to us, but there are also important differences. So to what extent can we take the sort of reference set that you've created and say, well, that's how a human works? You're absolutely right. And there are differences between mice and human. This period of development which in the mouse is between six and a half and eight and a half days after fertilization, translates to between 14 and 20 days after fertilization in human. This stage of human development is inaccessible to us. We can't study this. So we have no choice at this stage anyway than to turn to model systems. Mouse is a good model because we have access to a lot of these genetic mutations and they're often really good copies of human development mutations. The second important point is where this is then directly useful is if scientists want to grow in their lab organs such as muscle, etc., they need to have a reference point of how does the animal make it? And this is what our reference map landscape provides. Let's look how it happens in the animal and then design our in-the-lab protocols based on that. It's amazing work. Bertie Gotkin's there, and that work was just published in the journal Nature. Now, you may well have come across the idea of having a slug of whiskey on a cold day to keep out the chill. Maybe you've even resorted to this yourself and you thought at the time, well, that worked quite well. Unfortunately, we're going to have to burst this boozy bubble for you because it's a myth. And here's Georgia Mills with why. All that mean February chill. Why not have a few sips of whiskey to warm your cockles and put fire in your blood? Ooh. Alcohol is the subject of many, many myths. It's anyone's guess as to why that could be. But the beer jacket belief is one of the more dangerous ones out there. Alcohol, far from warming you up, makes you much more vulnerable to cold. In moderate amounts, alcohol is a vasodilator a word designed so that no inebriated person could ever say it. It means that the blood vessels in your skin widen, which causes more blood to travel from your core to your outer surfaces. The blood brings heat with it, and your skin is full of nerves and very sensitive to temperature change. So while your core temperature has actually got lower from that warm blood leaving, your brain is told you're feeling hotter. This, alongside heat generated from the liver trying to break down those tequila shots, can be a real treat for the odd reveller who forgot to take their coat to a party as they can skip merrily home, unaware of the cold and presumably pass out in a bush somewhere. Unfortunately, being aware of the cold is a pretty solid survival tool. We have physiological and behavioural contingency plans in place to prevent us from getting too cold. If it's chilly, your body should redirect the blood to your core, as this means you lose less heat. Just like a pie will cool down quicker on the window than by the oven, blood near your skin loses heat much more quickly. So, by redirecting blood to the surface, all those wines have unhelpfully reversed the process that's meant to keep us from getting too cold. Booze can also prevent us from shivering properly, and the fact that you feel so hot can even trick your body into sweating, thus cooling you down even more. (sighs) All this combines to mean we're feeling a lot hotter, but we're actually much colder. This can and has caused death from hypothermia in some cases. So does this mean we should save those cocktails for a hot summer's day to cool ourselves down? Well, maybe not. Alcohol just isn't our friend. According to one study in rats, scientists found that alcohol simply stopped the hot or cold rodents from maintaining their healthy temperature. This means that after a point or two, in cold weather you get colder and in hot weather you get hotter. Sometimes you just can't win. Oh dear. Georgia Mills there. If you'd like to find out more about any of the stories we've been covering so far on the programme, the references and the transcripts are all on our website, nakedscientist.com. The Naked Scientist podcast is produced in association with Spitfire, cost-effective voice, internet and IP engineering services for UK businesses. Find out how Spitfire can empower your company at spitfire.co.uk. And now on The Naked Scientist, over to Georgia Mills, who's got off the sofa and strapped on her runners for this week's show. It's arguably one of the most popular sports in the world. In 2016, users of the running app Strava logged enough runs to get to the moon and back 900 times. So this week I'm finding out what running does to your brain and body, whether you can put exercise in a pill and if humans really are born to run. First up, as a non-runner myself, I want to find out more about what people actually get out of it. 
Jen Gaskell is an associate professor at Nottingham University and she's an ultra marathon runner. So she runs for distances many would consider difficult and that I would consider insanity. I always loved running around as a kid and um, I really liked being in the mountains and just ended up running lots of mountain races and increasing the distance every year. My favourite race is Tour de Géants in Italy. That's 340 kilometres long with three times the height of Everest. Um, goes through some really beautiful mountains in the Italian Alps. 340? How long does that take? Um, my best time is 115 hours, but I think I can do under 100 hours next time. When do you sleep? So they do have checkpoints down in the valleys and you pass some mountain refuges where you're allowed to stay for an hour or two. And sometimes just at the side of the trail in the sun, if it's nice weather. I think in total, I had about six hours the first time I did it. What made you want to go sort of beyond a marathon? I just really enjoy the long adventures because you see so much and you see it at unique times of the day. So you might not go out for a hike in the Italian Alps at 3am um, in a storm. But if you're out running already, you'll see this amazing lightning and things and you, you cover quite a lot of ground. So one of the races I've done as well is the Ultra Trail de Mont Blanc, where you run the 11 day hiking route around Mont Blanc but you can run it in one or two days so you really see quite a lot of things doing this ultra running. And is is the Mont Blanc trail is that the hardest ultra marathon there is or have you got an, an eye on a new challenge? So there is a 450 kilometre version of Tour de Géants this year called Tour de Glacier and that's got even more ascent probably four times the height of Everest and next year, I'll be running a 900 kilometre race across the Himalayas. But I think by then it becomes a bit easier because you actually do have to sleep every night. Now, Jen has reached the extremes of long distance running. But when any of us run, either to the bus stop or across an entire mountain range, our body goes through several changes. We've all felt them. But what are they and why do they happen? A physiologist and keen runner, Christoph Schwening from Cambridge University, took me through what happens when you start at a gentle jog. What we see are a set of changes that gradually develop over time. And most of the time, you won't be aware of what those changes are. They'll be occurring at the cellular level, the level of the microcirculation around the muscles. So when you first start this very gentle running, your muscles will be contracting more often. As a result, they'll be squeezing the blood vessels within them, most importantly the veins, pushing blood gradually back towards the heart. So we call that an increase in venous return. So there'll be changes within your circulatory system, the control of your heart rate. Also, as those muscles gradually become more active, they start to run down some of the early initial energy sources that you've got within the muscle, and they'll gradually begin to build up uh, metabolites, which will lead to a dilatation of the blood vessels. Dilatation means simply the blood vessels swelling in size, allowing more blood flow through the muscles. Even your breathing rate, that will gradually start to uh, increase, and you won't even uh, notice that that rate has begun to increase. Obviously the temperature uh, will start to rise. First of all in the active muscles it will creep up uh, by a tenth of a degree C gradually maybe every minute or so and you won't notice that. Your core body temperature will also gradually start to rise as well. Now as you start to run progressively faster those changes begin to build up. And the whole of your physiology begins to fight all of these changes to try and maintain the various parameters within your body within a range that is acceptable and compatible for life. So, for instance, as the blood flow increases through your muscles, uh, your heart will gradually have to work harder, will have to pump more blood to keep your blood pressure up and to keep your brain perfused with blood. And that increase in rate will begin to put 
a stress upon the circulatory system. The consumption of oxygen and the buildup of CO2 will start to change the blood gases. And actually, it's the buildup of CO2 which begins uh, to be the first thing that you really notice. And that's because that CO2 enters the brain, a specific part of the brain, where it changes the pH. And that drives up your breathing frequency. So your respiration rate increases and you actually breathe more deeply as well. So those changes then start to become obvious and gradually larger as you run. You start to get hotter. And as you start to get hotter, you begin to sweat. And that becomes something that you'll notice as well. You might even notice the slight prickling on the skin as the blood flow increases to the skin as well. In the end, if you keep on running, there is almost no system within the body that doesn't start to change. But what causes those horrible feelings when you push yourself further than you can really go? If you're exercising very intensely and you don't have the adaptations at the level of the muscle to support the exercise intensity that you're doing, you can end up not burning fat and carbohydrates efficiently using oxygen, but actually relying on anaerobic metabolism. And the result of that is that you lose a lot of that energy from the muscle. It literally disappears out into the circulatory system as uh, lactate, and you get alongside that an acidosis. So you can end up with the muscle becoming acidic. The result of that is that the muscle then becomes very inefficient and you also can get alongside that the painful feelings that some people refer to as a burn. The demand on the heart can end up being too high such that your blood pressure begins to uh, fall and you begin to feel woozy or lightheaded. There are a whole set of problems that uh, you can run up against. Another one is the gradual over overheating. So as you're exercising, your muscles are getting very hot. Now, if your sweat glands are are not adapted or they haven't started sweating early enough, then your temperature is going to rise higher than is compatible with normal processing in the brain. So the first thing that you find is it becomes much harder to think straight as you get progressively hotter. And indeed, your motivation to continuing exercising decreases quite dramatically. All that being said, I had a go on Christoph's lab-based treadmill measuring my heart rate and skin temperature to get a quantifiable measurement of quite how unfit I was. My heart rate was too high, being too small and inefficient to get enough oxygen to the muscles, and I heated up like a lamp, clearly an inefficient use of energy. So Christoph gave me a challenge, go on a 2k run twice every single day for a month to see what happens. So what I'm hoping uh, we're going to see is that one of the adaptations will be the training of your sweat glands. That will have the effect of keeping your body a little bit cooler, preventing the temperature rise. I'm expecting to see that your heart rate will be lower. The reason for that is you will undergone a little bit of plasma volume expansion. You'll have literally produced more blood. That more blood means that with each heartbeat, uh, you'll be pumping around a little bit more blood and therefore a little bit more oxygen as well. Now, we're going to require you to get a bigger heart. And unfortunately, unfortunately, that's not going to be a transplant. We can either stretch your heart a little bit. You're going to be doing... Sounds very painful. (laughs) Well, you you do that all the time. So when blood comes back uh, to your heart, and that stretches the heart a, a little bit. So that stretching is going to become a little bit greater. With running having such a drastic impact on our bodies, both short and long term, is it something we're particularly well suited to do? Daniel Lieberman is a professor at Harvard University of Human Evolutionary Biology. He looks at when, why and how humans first got on the fast track. Well, humans have probably been running always, right? You know, our ancestors had to run away from leopards and predators or when they fought each other. But we started probably to do long distance running, a very peculiar form of running, sometime between about two and three million years ago. Why do you say long distance is a peculiar form of running? Well, very few animals run long distances. So chimpanzees, for example, or other monkeys and apes will run occasionally, but usually they sprint briefly, you know, for 100 meters or so, and then they collapse, they get hot and bothered, and they don't really go very far, just to get away from each other when they're fighting or to get away from a predator that chases them briefly into a tree. But humans are are special. Humans are one of a few groups of animals that will run very long distances, like 5 or 10 or 15 kilometers on a regular basis. Not many animals do that. 
And why did we start doing that? Well, it's impossible to know for sure without a time machine. But the only explanation that anybody's really been able to come up with is that we ran in order to get meat. You know, carnivores have to run. Most carnivores do that by chasing rapidly their prey. They sprint. So think of a cheetah chasing a gazelle. But we can't do that. Humans are slow. Because we're bipeds, we can produce force with only two legs as opposed to four legs. So we're about half as slow as most animals, our body size. And so humans do something completely different. We chase animals over long distances and tire them out. We actually cause them to develop heat stroke. Here's how it works. Most animals, when they run, they use four legs and they cool by panting. And it's not that effective a way of cooling your body. We cool by sweating. So we secrete water all over our bodies and that enables us to dump heat very effectively. And that gives us a huge advantage over four-legged animals because four-legged animals can pant when they're trotting. But when four-legged animals run fast, when they gallop, they can no longer pant. And the reason for that is that galloping is a sort of seesaw gait in which the guts of the animal slam into the diaphragm with every step. So galloping animals, you take your dog for a run, you can find this out very quickly. You know, if you make your dog run fast, your dog will have to gallop. The dog will not be able to pant while it's galloping. And don't do this too long on a hot day or you'll kill your dog. But we can, because we don't gallop, we don't have that problem. So if you can make an animal gallop for a long period of time in the heat, you can actually cause that animal to overheat and it will collapse. So hunters sometimes take advantage of this. What they'll do is they'll find an animal and they'll find the biggest animal they can because big animals, just like big humans, overheat faster than small animals. And then they'll chase it. And of course, the animal will run faster than the human can, but the human will track it and then chase it again. And if the hunter can get to the animal and chase it again before the animal has cooled down, then the animal's body temperature will go up and up and up and up. And eventually, usually after about a half marathon's distance of running, the animal will completely collapse. And then the hunter doesn't even need any weapons or technology, can just walk up and kill it with a rock or something like that without much danger. You, you put your money where your mouth is, is that right, in this theory? Oh, yeah. So a few years ago, just to kind of try this out, I, I entered a race that's been run every year for the last, I don't know, 25 years or so in a town called Prescott, Arizona. It's called Man Against Horse. And every year, a bunch of humans race horses over a mountain. It's a marathon length race. And uh, even though I'm not a particularly great runner, I'm just a middle aged professor. There were, I think, 50 something horses and I beat all but 13 of them. So, uh, and, I, <laughs> and again, I'm not a great runner. I'm not an elite runner. So, and the reason is the horses get too hot, but the humans can keep going. Considering then that this long distance running was basically how we got our food, what, what ways did our bodies change? How did we adapt to this lifestyle? Our bodies have changed literally from head to toe. I mean, we have features all over our bodies that help us be incredible long distance runners and they, they include having short toes. So we have short toes to prevent for ourselves from breaking them when we run. We have arches in our feet, which act like springs, which store and release mechanical energy. We have long Achilles tendons, much, much longer than those of say chimpanzees and gorillas. And again, those act as giant springs to help us run efficiently. The largest muscle in our body is the gluteus maximus. It's the muscle in our bone, the largest muscle, a very beautiful muscle indeed, but also very important for running and to prevent us from falling over and not important for walking. Um, we have waists that are able to twist independently. We have special mechanisms in our necks to help keep our heads stable. We're furless and have sweat glands all over our bodies. In our ears, we have organs of balance that are specially tuned to handle the frequencies and demands of, of running. I mean, literally, we have changes from the tops to our bottoms of our body that make us really good at running. Harvard University's Daniel Lieberman there on why we were born to run. This is The Naked Scientist. This week, you're with me, Georgia Mills, as I examine our relationship with running. Earlier we heard about the effect running has on your body, but what does it do to your brain? Henriette von Prague is Associate Professor of Biomedical Sciences at the Brain Institute at Florida University. Well, running has extensive effects on the brain. In humans, overall, the effects are very beneficial. What we see is that there's benefits for our ability to think, manage time, pay attention, plan, 
We also see benefits for our ability to remember events, places, people, and how they are linked together. In addition to that, we see actual changes in brain structure with exercise. So there's an increase in what we call the gray matter, the part of the brain that contains the neurons, and also white matter, which consists of the axonal pathways that connect cells to each other. And we see also an increase in particular in the size of the brain area that's very important for learning and memory, called the hippocampus. And incidentally, this is the same brain area that is often affected in neurodegenerative conditions such as Alzheimer's disease. And what happens with exercise is that there is an, an increase in the volume of the hippocampus and we also see upregulation of blood flow in that area and in other areas of the brain. And then if we talk about things such as mood or um, anxiety, is that uh, with exercise, there's a reduction in anxiety, there's improvement in sleep quality, um, reduction in stress hormone levels. So this is, these are kind of the things we know um, in humans. Why do we think you get these benefits in the brain? With exercise, there are neurochemical changes in the brain. So there are changes in neurotransmitters. And some of these neurotransmitters are called monoamines, and they include dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine. And that family of neurotransmitters is strongly implicated. Exercise upregulates the level of monoamines. In addition, exercise, it will also upregulate a protein called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF. This is a very important growth factor in the brain, which is important for uh, survival, growth of neurons. It, it, it influences their um, complexity. It also influences their ability of neurons to communicate with each other. So it's been shown that if levels of BDNF are low, there can be increased anxiety and there can also be learning and memory problems. But other things we can see is in terms of uh, measures of anxiety is, for example, stress hormones levels, such as cortisol in the bloodstream. And those also re go down with exercise over time and may lead to a reduction in anxiety and depression. But Henriette and her team had an idea. Perhaps not all of these changes were originating inside the brain. Not just the brain is running, your whole body is running. You are recruiting you know, your heart, bloodstream and, of course, skeletal muscle. So one of the things that we are very interested in is what is released out of skeletal muscle that might influence brain function. Henriette isolated muscle cells and treated them with compounds to activate energy pathways, basically engineering exercise in a dish. They took the metabolic soup that came out of the cells, found the compound of interest inside, and then added it to brain cells to see what the effect was. You can see an increase in endurance if you give these kind of compounds. And you can also see an improvement in memory function, suggesting that this kind of pathway of activation may be one of the sources of the effects of exercise on the brain. Right, so something that sort of leaks out of our muscles while we exercise makes its way into yeah. the brain and we think could be potentially causing some of those benefits. Yes, or at least setting a cascade of events in motion that links to all this plethora of effects that I just described. Does this mean that we could, if we, if we know that factor, could we sort of bottle up exercise and put it in a pill for maybe those of us who aren't able to go? Oh, no, 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 no. That would be extremely dangerous because, <laughs> ah. <laughs> no, no, good try. But unfortunately, um, those kind of factors are very tied to our physiology. And if you have, you know, too much, it could be detrimental. Too little is, is also not good. That said, it's, you know, it's not completely out of the realm of possible that if we learn more about these factors and know how to, you know, potentially modify them, let's say chop off a little bit of the sequences that are potentially involved in, in detrimental effects, that we could harness them. But then I would probably think only, let's say, in cases where, um, you know, somebody's incapacitated, cannot, cannot walk well and help them kind of transition back into, to an active uh, lifestyle. But it would definitely not um, replace the act you know, the complete package of the um, 
benefits of, of exercise um, on our brains, on, on memory function and on, on mood. So you can't get the benefits of running unless you actually do it. Which is a shame because my own little running experiment got totally thrown off by a bout of flu. So even with about three weeks of solid running, I didn't get any measurable benefits. The changes just take a bit longer to come in, which Christoph explained is why so many people give up after the two-week mark. So when you first start off running, there are a whole load of changes at the level of the neurons and your perception of what running is about. It's before the fatigue kicks in. So you start to feel very good. You get, if you like, after the very first run, maybe a little bit of a runner's high. It's never happened to me, but I hear it can happen. And then gradually the fatigue starts to build up. Whilst you run, you do a little bit of damage to the muscles and that gradually accumulates. Then hopefully after a period of about two to three weeks, things start to get better. Unfortunately, I think you got the flu just at the critical point and you stopped running. In fact, you had a little bit of bed rest, I think, which is the worst possible thing you can do for run training. The real big change is they take a period of many weeks to occur. So a couple of months and then things start to get really a lot better. But the plasma volume expansion that you can get, that gradual thinning of the blood as you pull in more water from the extracellular space, that can happen very quickly indeed. So we were sort of hoping that that would happen after your last minute bout of running that you did over the weekend. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like we were able to detect that. Maybe it wasn't quite intense enough. I don't know. I mean, I said I'd do 10k a day and I did about four, so (laughs) that's probably why. And this, Christoph says, is another useful lesson. If you're training for a marathon or similar, last-minute panic training does very, very little. So if you can push past the two-week mark and keep at it, what is the long-term impact on your health? There are very, very many long-term benefits of running. Obviously, the first thing is you're burning a little bit more energy, which is generally a a good thing to do because we live in an environment where energy is very easy to come by. So being a little bit more active is good. Uh, You tend to start off by lowering blood pressure. That tends to fall as well as you run. And then longer term, of course, you're helping to build a more healthy heart, one with a greater blood supply and a generally more elastic circulatory system system and that's all very good. So the long-term effects of running and indeed the effects of loading the bones, so bone density tends to increase, everything tends to get a little bit better when you do a bit more exercise. To get a healthy life into old age I think exercise is absolutely critical. So there you have it. It's good for our body, it's good for our brains and as Dan Lieberman said it's why we have such big beautiful bums. So we should really make use of them. I've definitely heard enough to give it another go. So I asked Christoph, as a runner himself, for any tips to keep motivated. Okay, so the first uh, bit of advice is don't get injured. I mean, that's that's a real. There's nothing worse uh, than getting injured. Uh, every runner has a story about injury, and my uh, story at the moment is very real to me. So. One is take it sensibly uh, and exercise very sensibly. Build it into a lifestyle as well. There's no point in making running something special that you have to make a special time for during the day. And running isn't something that you have to be particularly prepared or set up to do. You can add running into many of your daily activities. I do something that's known as a run commute. Building it into those times where you need to do some form of transportation And I would also say take the intensity of your running down. Sure, add in some high intensity if you enjoy it, but there's a very nice social aspect to running a little bit more slowly, of taking a little bit of time. So doing that kind of social running is a very powerful way of enabling yourself to continue with the exercise uh, through life. Don't get obsessed with it. And also don't assume that the limits that you see now are the real uh, limits that exist. Everybody is capable of being a runner. And to add a couple from me, find a running buddy who doesn't run faster than you, don't take your useless fat spaniel who'll slow you down, and definitely, definitely don't get the flu. Good luck. And if you run enough, you might just experience the wonderful feeling known as runner's high. Back to Jen. You might have just had the worst low of your life. You might have had absolutely no energy at all. And then you eat a little bit, you drink a little bit, and 20 minutes later, you'll be running along through the storm. You'll be running up hills and you'll feel like if Usain Bolt turned up and wanted a 100 metre race against you, you'd definitely beat him. 
and everything is just fantastic. Like the views, you just love everything. You love all your friends around you. You just absolutely love doing what you're doing and you never want to stop. So you just keep running. Thank you to all my guests this week. That's Jen Gaskell, Dan Lieberman, Henriette von Prague and Christoph Schwiening. Next week on The Naked Scientist, we're looking at what happens when biology gets out of control. The Naked Scientist is brought to you from Cambridge University and it's sponsored by the EPSRC and Rolls-Royce. I'm Georgia Mills and thank you very much for listening. Goodbye. Goodbye.